For those of you listening who are professional brewers, I'm here to tell you that planning brew schedules just got easier. Starting now, Imperial Yeast guarantees that commercial orders up to 20 liters of three of their most popular strains will ship free if they're not in stock when you place your order. So in addition to pitching right with the highest quality yeast on the market, they're promising that yeast will be ready when you need it or shipping is on them. A rad deal from a rad company. Whether you're a pro or a home brewer, if you haven't tried Imperial Yeast in your brewery yet, it's time to up your game. You can check out everything Imperial Yeast has to offer and place your commercial orders at imperialyeast.com. Hey, everybody, you're listening to the Brewlosophy Podcast. I am your host, Marshall Schott. And on this episode, we're going to be sharing with all of you wonderful listeners a reward usually reserved for our patrons. These are the people who appreciate what we're doing enough to pledge $3 or more per month over at patreon.com slash brewlosophy. Over the last year, we've had some pretty incredible guests uh, give Q&As to our patrons. Vinny Chalurzo from Russian River Brewing Company, John Kimmich from The Alchemist, John Palmer, Gordon Strong, Michael Tonsmeyer, Scott Janish, and so many more. And we've got some killer guests lined up uh, for the next year as well. Anyway, last month, the guest was Brewlosophy's own Matt Del Fiaco, our contributor from the Chicago area who has a love for all things cider, barrel-aged, and high ABV. Matt took questions from patrons for an hour in our private Facebook group, and I figured we'd share this session with all of you fine folks today. So uh, I would like to ask, at least to those of you who enjoy what we're doing here at the Brewlosophy Podcast and over at brewlosophy.com, to consider becoming a patron of ours over at patreon.com slash brewlosophy. Uh, For as little as a buck a month, you'll be rewarded with things like unpublished contributor recipes, access to patron-only groups, participation in monthly live Q&A sessions with people in the brewing world, and unique discounts at yakimavalleyhops.com. We seriously could not do this without the help of our patrons, so cheers to those who have been supporting us. We love you, and thanks to those who are considering supporting us in the future. Again, you can have a look at all of our pledge levels and rewards at patreon.com slash brewlosophy. Another really easy way to support us, especially during the holiday season, is by using the links found at brewlosophy.com slash support when you're doing your online shopping. Your shopping experience doesn't change at all, and we get a little kickback that helps us to continue producing this show. All right, feedback this week is brought to you by Brewers Hardware, who offer Brewers badass stainless equipment like the Turnkey BH15 Pilot Brewing System, which has a hard plum manifold to eliminate all hosing changes during the brew process. Brewers Hardware also has a ton of unique purpose-built products useful to both professionals and home brewers. Go see for yourself at brewershardware.com, and don't forget to mention Brewlosophy at checkout to receive a free gift. That's brewershardware.com. So I recently discovered that we had a setting in our feedback email that wasn't pushing messages or all of our messages through to the inbox. Uh, I I fixed this setting and boom, nearly 200 emails from listeners showed up. Uh, The the very few that did trickle through, we were able to respond to earlier, but uh, that was a lot of emails for me to see. I usually try to be as responsive as possible uh, when people reach out to us. So this made me kind of feel bad for the people who, who emailed, you know, over a year ago and were expecting a response. Um, there were a ton of emails in there. I am trying to, to get back you know, to everyone who, who has, who has uh, emailed us through the feedback at brewlosophy.com email. If you've sent something to that email and never got a response, I'm sorry for that. Uh, thankfully, everything is working fine now, so you can use that. So with that out of the way, listener Rob Friesel, a few months ago, he's from Essex Junction, Vermont, had a comment on our DMS Off Flavor show, which was way back on episode 54. He said, I love the show, but something from the DMS Off Flavor episode was kind of bugging me. Around 24 minutes or so, Malcolm says something to the effect of, you know what the judge meant uh, when they say that they picked up DMS and put it down on the score sheet. I've been on both sides of this as a judge and as a competitor, and I and I don't know that it's always so clear cut. Uh, he says, as I, I was listening to the part that part of the episode, I was having flashbacks to one of the episodes about astringency in off flavor that, that plagues a few of my score sheets, and I was thinking, sometimes someone is just stating a belief because that's the closest match they have. This isn't to say that no one can pick up DMS. He says, on the contrary, I believe I'm pretty sensitive to it, but rather that competitors should treat the judges' feedback with skepticism because after all, they're only human. And as judges, we need to sometimes be mindful of how to give the feedback because again, we're only human. Uh, I, I can't say that I don't 
disagree with Rob on this. Uh, there's a lot, uh, I've got a lot of opinions when it comes to uh, beer evaluation in general or, or any time you're sharing some sort of a, uh, an opinion that has to be uh, inarguably influenced by an, a subjective experience uh, as you know, taste and aroma and mouthfeel is. Uh, I feel like in brewing for a long time, there's been this push. We've all, you know, who hasn't heard? You should submit beers to competitions to get objective feedback. I am, I am not convinced, and this has nothing. I'm not dogging on people who enjoy competing or who enjoy the process of evaluating beer, uh, but I'm not convinced that the feedback you get from a judge is any better than the feedback you would get from people sitting at a pub, regardless of their training. They might know how to use certain words better or how to describe what they're tasting better, but they're just as I, I guess influenced or biased by you know the desire to look smart as we all are, or the desire to want to be the one who tastes uh, that unique thing and points it out before the next person does. Again, not dissing people who enjoy judging beer. I'm, I'm a certified BJCP judge myself, uh, though I, I don't really use that much anymore these days. Uh, but yeah, Rob, I couldn't agree with you more. And and I, you know Malcolm and I have talked about this a bit as well. That uh, you, you know I think what when he when he made that comment, you know what the judgment, you know, if you get DMS on your score sheet, uh, I might know what the judge meant that they picked up something that they tended to perceive as, as maybe corny or whatever. Um, but, but that doesn't mean that DMS was in the beer. I, you know, again, I, I think we talked about this on that episode that, um, I, it's my opinion, very strongly held opinion <laughs> that, uh, judges um, or, or people who evaluate beer in general may make mistakes. So they might interpret graininess as corn because they've been told to look out for corn, or they might, you know, interpret, uh, caramel as diacetyl because, you you know, they've been told that diacetyl has this kind of buttery thing, but but so does caramel. So, um, you know, the only real way that we're ever going to know if there is an off flavor in a beer is to have it lab tested. And so, you know, because of the difficulty in that, I do think that there's still value, you know, in having your beer evaluated by people uh, who, who, you know, are, are trained, I guess, uh, to evaluate beer. That doesn't mean you should put all your weight, you know, in that or, or rely just on the feedback that you get on a score sheet, at least in my opinion. So uh, to me, the best evaluator is the person who's making the beer because you are usually the one who's drinking it. So, uh, Rob, thank you so much for the feedback. Again, I apologize that it took us so long to get back to you on it. Uh, if you have show feedback, you can send it to feedback at brewlosophy.com. It is now working, or you can drop us a note on social media. I'm not really one to seek out hazy New England IPA, which isn't to say that I'm a hater of the style. I just tend to experience most as having a certain characteristic that I'm personally not huge, uh, not a huge fan of. Uh, but I'm always happy to try new beers. I don't care what the style is. And when my friend Paul Nicodem came to town from Sydney, Australia, he brought me a beer in a really plain looking can with the name Haze. A New England style IPA made by Filter Brewing, that's P-H-I-L-T-E-R Brewing, out of Merrickville, New South Wales, Australia. One minute beer review with Jersey and Tim. Okay, let's Here review some beer. Ooh, this looks potentially like some orange juice soup. It does look like orange juice. Soup. Orange juice soup. Oh, yeah. Okay, this is probably a New England IPA, and it's yes. just the way it's, I like this it. This is good. Yep. For me to say that, no. This is... Uh, so I, I mean, of course, not a professional judge of New England IPAs, but this is what? how I like it. It's light, it e easy. It's not cloudy and milky and all that. It's not it's crazy not bitter. heavy. It's not crazy. It's bitter. light. It's clean. It's crisp. It's got a little bit of flavor. It's just not trying to do too much. It's so delicious. I'm happy to because yeah. we we've we've had bad luck with these in the past and we've kind of fallen away from them. Yeah. These are bar these are only beers you're going to get in a brewery. Like you, nobody goes to the gas station and buys New England IPA. It's dead. It's commercially anymore, dead. Yeah. There's only breweries in my mind. Like, that's it. So to taste a good one makes me happy because I would drink this, dude. Yeah. I, I would drink this a lot. So good. So crisp, Dang. clean. There's not too much of the orange juice soup flavor. It's just just enough to tell you, dude, I'm not a real IPA. I'm this new, different kind of IPA. Yeah. Not new anymore. It's old. You know, I'm a different <laughs> kind of IPA. Oh, I like this a lot. Timmy, you're not I, an IPA guy. What do you think? I am not an IPA guy, and, and I'm, 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 I'm liking this. Okay. That's, it's that's, not, it's that's not, good. I'm not liking it as much as you are. Well, you're a little... You're that doesn't a, mean anything. You're a little less learned, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> this is so good, man. It's palatable. Yeah, it's good. I like this a lot. Mm. Oh, I love it. There's no weird flavors. There's no bad finishes. There's nothing. It's just it's good. It's just straight up juniper. It's good. If I was trying to introduce someone to this and be like, this is, you know, these are why I like these. This would be the one. This is delicious. It's very yeah. good. What's good about it is it's not like the crazy long, long aftertaste. It's just... 
bam, you get the flavor and it doesn't continue. That was a good review. Welcome to the IPA team. Mm. And it's gone. Dang. That was good. That was good. I like it. Thank you. I give it 10 jerseys and nobody cares about your rating, but go ahead. That's, that's true. We'll, we'll go with seven. Oh, okay. For a total of seven tens. So judging by the can alone, I admittedly uh, presumed that this beer was going to be utter junk, but boy, was I wrong. Hayes, despite its appearance, was surprisingly good and didn't have that weird chalky thing I get from a lot of uh, modern New England IPAs today. Really nice work to Filter Brewing. Thank you for making such a delicious version of a hazy IPA. Uh, You know, I would have to contend that maybe this one bordered on uh, that West Coast flavor profile a little bit more than New England, but it was hazy, so I give them that. Regardless, I would definitely pay for this beer in a pub or pick up a six pack at the at the you know grocery store. It was super good. Thanks again to Paul Nicodem for hooking me up with so many beers that I can't get my hands on over here in California. Uh, it's been a lot of fun to go through those and try them with my friends. Uh, if you'd like to have your beer or any other fermented beverage reviewed by Jersey and Tim on the show, you can email me, Marshall at Brewlosophy.com, and we'll get you all set up. Alrighty, when we return, Brewlosophy's Matt Del Fiaco. Chilling work can be a chore, especially after a long brew day, but not with the Exchillerator Counterflow Chiller, which can chill a 5-gallon or 19-liter batch of wort in 5 minutes or less, leading to a strong cold break and clearer wort in the fermenter. Brewlosophy's Matt Del Fiaco uses the Exchillerator Max and absolutely loves it. In addition to improved chilling efficiency, every Exchillerator comes with a 5-year warranty that covers the entire chiller for manufacturer defects. If you're looking to up your chilling game and a CFC is right for you, head over to Exchillerator.com today. As every brewer knows, the best beer requires the best hops, which Yakima Valley Hops provides fresh from the source to brewers around the world, carrying everything from classics like Cascade to modern favorites like Galaxy and Mosaic, as well as other ingredients and gear, Yakima Valley Hops has it all. And don't forget to check out their new podcast, The Late Edition, where the YVH crew goes into depth on our favorite plant with industry experts. Head over to YakimaValleyHops.com now to see all they have to offer and subscribe to The Late Edition wherever it is you listen to podcasts. Want to brew quality craft beer at home? The Grainfather provides a brewing system with superior design, innovative features, and the latest technology allowing you to brew professional quality craft beer at home. Mash, sparge, boil, and cool all in one unit, meaning there's less equipment to use, clean, and store. No need for burners or hot plates. Just plug it in and brew great beer. Then get the best out of your fermentation with the Grainfather Conical Fermenters and Glycol Chiller. Plus enhance your brewing experience with the brand new free-to-use Grainfather Community app. You can take your brewing tools and your recipes with you everywhere. Use brewing calculators on the fly, manage your recipes, and monitor your brew session from anywhere. Use your mobile device to manage your grandfather brew wirelessly, automate mass schedules, and multitask without removing any of the brewing hands-on fun. Grainfather products can all be found at www.grainfather.com. Plus, as a Brewlosophy podcast listener, get 10% off your order. Just use discount code BREWLOSOPHY19 at checkout. That's BRULOSOPHY19 to receive 10% off your order. So head to shop.grainfather.com now to get this great deal. Hello, uh, my name is Matt Del Fiaco. Thank you guys so much for uh, joining me today for the Q and A. Um, I'm going to be doing just the live cast right now, uh, and I'm really excited to answer any questions that you guys have. Uh, first, a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Matt Del Fiaco. I am a contributor to Brewlosophy, uh, obviously, as I'm as I'm here. Uh, but otherwise, as far as like my credentials go. Um, and I'll actually, I, uh, we just had Eric Pierce join. Um, and so this is actually a, a fantastic, uh, exactly what I was going to start talking about. So this is a good lead up into what we're doing. Uh, Eric asks, how long have you been brewing for? Um, I have been brewing for, I think seven or eight years now. Um, I started brewing when I was 20, when I was in college. Um, and I, I started brewing, uh, with a Mr. Beer extract kit, um, the, and you know, like those little plastic, uh, kegs that they have. And I was fermenting in the, uh, cabinet above my refrigerator, uh, that my roommates were, were great enough to let me use. Um, but after that, I started fermenting in one gallon jugs in my desk in college and, uh, had a lot of mishaps. So, uh, what was your most spectacular brewing fail? Uh, 
That's a great question. Uh, I, I'm going to go with like the one that was probably the uh, most just expensive. Like in terms of spectacular, it was the the worst um, from like a money standpoint. Uh, I had just got a uh, my very first kegerator, um, and I was in a, an apartment in college, which was just the best. Um, I really enjoyed that, and it was when I was in grad school. So I didn't have like tons of money. I, I had a stipend. I was doing some internships, but I, uh, I didn't really have a lot. And so the fact that I got this kegerator was something like it was really, really great. And I made a, a big thing of Russian Imperial stout to celebrate, which is one of my favorite styles. And I tapped it, uh, made sure everything was connected properly. I had like the old Perlick taps. I was really excited about, I just ordered to like kind of be fancy about it. And I left to go to school uh, and came back and the uh, there was like a really uh, stale smell in the air and so I had uh, I guess I had a leaky o-ring or something that like the perlicks are kind of notorious for and I had leaked uh, five gallons of Russian Imperial stout onto the carpet in this main room like I was on the second floor apartment uh, and I just destroyed this carpet absolutely obliterated it it smelled horrible I wasted five gallons of Imperial stout which was you know substantial uh, on its own um, so that was easily my biggest failure is the fact that I not only just wasted that beer but I had to pay to get that carpet actually replaced. I, we had to replace the whole thing. It had sunk into the padding beneath. It was really, really horrible. I was gone at school all day. Um, really, really bad in that regard. That sucked. So that's that's the worst one. Um, another question that Eric has is, what was the weirdest beer you ever made? <sighs> I don't. I don't think I make too many weird beers. I think. I think the weirdest beer that I've made intentionally is uh, I, I make a beer, a party guile brew. I use the second runnings from my imperial stout to brew a vanilla, um, a vanilla coffee imperial or a vanilla coffee stout i guess uh or vanilla coffee porter whatever you want to call it and add lactose and that is uh, i call a gentleman's mocha um and then cocoa nibs obviously for them for the mocha part so coffee vanilla uh cocoa nibs and lactose um so that's that's probably the weirdest beer i make intentionally the weirdest beer i have made unintentionally was probably oh you know what i'm lying to you this was intentional this was intentional and it actually might be a runner-up for my biggest failure uh when i was a brand new brewer like i said i was in college and at the time like sriracha was the biggest thing it was it was like the height of the craze uh for sriracha and so i went about brewing a sriracha beer it was like my third brew like it was the it was it was i had no business um attempting it and I did no research so what my plan was is I was going to brew this extract beer I was going to just load it with sriracha before fermentation and then load it with sriracha post fermentation um so that taste that tasted about as uh, as good as you could probably imagine it was. Uh, there's a lot of preservatives in sriracha. Garlic is an inhibitor. There's vinegar uh, in sriracha, uh, and it was just generally disgusting. It was really really bad. I actually had uh, around that same time I had Rogues sriracha stout that they did, and I also didn't love that. Um, and just it's it's I like sriracha still, and I like hot sauce a lot. I love hot sauce. Um, that's a fun hobby. If you're interested in branching out into other kinds of fermentation related things, uh, definitely hot sauce is a good one. But uh, yeah, I. I, I can't recommend sriracha stout to anybody or just sriracha, just sriracha. It was like a sriracha pale, basically. Um, so that was definitely the weirdest beer I've ever made. And it was the worst. Uh, and then Eric's last question is, what is your desert island beer? Um, my desert island beer is uh, Pilsner Urkel absolutely hands down because uh 1050 is up there 1050 by oscar blues i've talked about before is one of my favorite uh beers on the market i love it it's a great imperial stout uh but it is a because it's a desert island uh that probably is not super enjoyable and i also kind of have to be in the mood for um an imperial stout so if it's not like a cider or something then i would go with with uh pilsner or Kel. absolutely i i love czech pilsner it's a fantastic style um Really, really just overall great, refreshing, really good to drink. Check pills, best pills. So while uh, people are rolling in and as we're like getting started here and as questions come in and hopefully this updates as I'm going through, um, I am just hanging out and uh, I, I've been cleaning all day. So it's, it's about 12 o'clock my time and I am right now uh, just actually tapped, if you can see this okay, um, a cider that was made a couple months ago with... Uh, 
uh, Imperial Yeast Bubbles, and I really like it. Um, it's definitely worth a try. If you if you haven't used that yeast yet, uh, it didn't attenuate like crazy. You know, like most ciders, you see them drop down to nothing. Um, but they are, you know, like, uh, sorry, like, uh, you know, a finishing gravity of like 1.000 or 0.998 or something really, really low. Uh, this finished a little higher, but it is very, very good. Um, nice, nice fruit character to it still uh, in that apple character. So highly recommended. If you haven't, uh, that's what I'm going to be drinking for the entirety of this. So... Uh, Brent Martin uh, asks brew, uh, about brewing competitions and better to be innovative or perfect standard recipes. Uh, this is a really, really phenomenal question. Um, so in regards to... Uh, in, in regards to uh, competitions, I'm a certified ranked judge, um, one point off national, unfortunately. Um, so I'm a certified judge. I've judged a lot of competitions. Um, so I'm, I'm maybe not like the best contributor to ask, but I certainly have some experience. Um, and I, in my personal opinion, I think it's better to be perfect for standard recipes. I, I think it's better to do a really, really good example of the job. But you have this weird uh, dichotomy, this weird problem when you're doing competitions is that you are judged in a flight of typically seven, potentially more, sometimes a little less, but usually about there. Uh, and not only do you need to be like a really, really good IPA, but you need to be an IPA that stands out in a field of IPAs. And so what ends up happening is like you need to be this caricature of of a beer. And I think Chris Colby talks about that in some of his articles about judging um, is, is you end up having like the character beers win the one that are the ones that are, I, I guess like pushing at the bounds of what that style is. The thing that stands out. Um, my dog is very upset. I'm not quite sure why, but yeah. So the, uh, I, I think you are better off going perfect to a standard. I, I think being innovative is great. And I think that you can learn a lot and be really, really good and like push those boundaries for sure. Um, but to, to be innovative is to put yourself, I think, in a little bit of danger. Um, I, I Especially when you have you know, three uh, Hellas or some, something really light and you want to be innovative, you want to like maybe just start pushing those boundaries and maybe hopefully stand out. You also uh, put yourself in a position to stand out in a bad way. So I, I think that's a little more dangerous. I, I think I prefer preferring to uh, brewing to a specific recipe, like within the bounds of what that style is. But a hundred percent, I don't think either of them is necessarily wrong. I think for competitions, you're better off doing a really, really a recipe really, really well. Um, but there's room, there's room for, for improvement or change there. Um, Jordan Hoffmeyer, uh, and if I butcher anyone's names during this, just go with that. That's totally cool. Um, if, uh, and I'm, I'm I, like, I apologize, but, um, there's just nothing I can do about it. Uh, so Jordan Hoffmeyer asks, uh, I used to, uh, I just, t uh, TOT some provoke the other day. Have you used it before for dry hopping or wood aging? Um, have you heard any recommendations? Is it a gimmick or is it innovative or, uh, or is it innovative? Uh, sort of, sort of in that same, um, that same line of things. So I'm gonna. I actually haven't. I I am a hundred percent. Actually, not even like a thousand percent sure uh, on what provoke is. Is I think I believe it's a hop. I believe it's a provoke. It's like a hop pellet. Um, so, anyways, in that regard, I. <sighs> I haven't. I, so first off, I haven't heard anything about it. That but that's just like the um, the baseline to start from. Um, I haven't heard any recommendations. I don't think it's necessarily a gimmick. Like I think there's a lot of room for innovation in hops and hop growth, and that's something that in the last podcast they talked about a lot. Um, or if you are, listen to the late edition, um, that is a fantastic podcast where they talk about industry stuff. So. There's a lot of room for innovation for sure. Um, I've never used it for dry hopping wood aging, but I would absolutely love to hear any thoughts you have. Like if you, you mentioned you've got some, Jordan, uh, if you try it out, please let me know. I would be really, really interested to hear more about it and just hear how it's going. Uh, Eric has another question, which is, do you have any recommendations for adding body to cider? Um, I've used barley to make cider beer beverages like graph graph is excellent. Love it. Um, what else can I do? I like the cider flavor, but it often seems thin and wanting more body. Yeah, that's totally fair. Um, like you have, uh, uh, so for, and I, uh, actually Marshall was kind enough to send me a text message just now, which is that, uh, pro Oak is a, a hop with wood in the pellets. Um, I, again, like, I think there's room for innovation. Um, I, 
I, I'm so hesitant to comment on something that I don't have personal experience with. So I, I think there's room for innovation. And I think that's a really fine line between innovation and gimmick. Like those are it really what that comes down to is, is it successful? Like if it's, if it's not successful, it's a gimmick. If it's successful, it's innovation. Like it's so subjective at that range. So uh, I really, Jordan, again, tell me your experience. Love that. But back to Eric's question about the uh, adding cider, adding body to cider. Um, so definitely, Eric, like I totally understand where you're coming from and also something to keep in mind, like especially if you're using uh, not fresh pressed cider, like uh, if you're using like a juice from um, the store, um, you're not using like, a fresh pressed juice, then it's typically going to have like less tannin content, less uh, just overall proteins. It's all it's been filtered, obviously, um, and all of it, it's been uh, processed in that way. So as the uh, I mean, obviously, as like the alcohol climbs up and the gravity climbs down, especially with cider yeasts, like I mentioned earlier, typically we would expect them to pretty much dry out, uh, whatever that is. Um, I think your first option is just to explore tannin additions. So they sell tannin powder. Um, there are a lot of uh, options you have for adding that. It can be added prior to fermentation or it can be added post fermentation. Um, some people swear that you get a different character regard uh, when you are uh, adding it at those different times, but I think that's worth exploring as well. Um, you should have a fair amount of body if you're using fresh pressed juice, but if you don't still, obviously, uh, if you're using an apple that maybe is, uh, it's been on the uh, tree a little bit longer, so it has uh, had more time to develop sugars, like it's more, it's sweeter, uh, or if you're using like dessert apples, uh, which I've done some great ciders with dessert apples, if you go down that route, then yeah, it's, it's going to be majority just sugar that it's going to eat down. Uh, so your options, definitely tannins. Um, I know people who use barley for it. Uh, I think that is... I think that's uh, still an option, but like you've sort of alluded to, especially with graph, it definitely has a character to it. Like it doesn't taste uh, just like a cider. It, it tastes like a blend, which can be great. I think graph is a really cool uh, drink and I think it's very good, but it, it, it definitely leaves uh, something else to it, unfortunately. So tannins definitely um i would also just explore uh less attenuative yeasts are an option um and something people forget about i don't know if you're drinking your ciders uh dry or sweet or um if you've drink if you have them carbonated or still uh it's something that you and i haven't really talked about but we can uh i you have so many options in the end of this. Like it's, it's a weird thing about beer where people tend to think about beer. Like you've finished fermentation and maybe you'll dry hop. Maybe you will add a wood aging product, but for the most part, like we tend to think of the end of fermentation and then carbonation, but carbonation even gets the short end of the stick, uh, as like the end of the process. Like you're, you, this is your final product. Um, which I would disagree with for beer as well, but for cider especially, and for things like meads and wines, uh, you're not even close. Like the end of fermentation, you still have several steps of tweaking and fine tuning that are opportunities for you to improve that product. Um, and if your uh, cider is really, really dry or really thin, uh, consider how you consider what you add as a sweetener to it. Consider what you're at, uh, how you're carbonating it. Those are all things that can tweak and influence your perception of the body. Maybe not just like the body itself, but the perception of, um, I would, I know in the last podcast, they talked a little bit about like lactose. I don't love lactose in cider. I think it does taste milky as they kind of alluded to, but uh, you certainly have other options for things that are going to contribute body. Something I do want to play with, and this is not uh, a recommendation. It's something to explore. I really want to try fermenting um, with maltodextrin and just other dextrins that have been added. Um, I think there's room to explore some of those, but I've never done it. I don't know what contributes, but it's something to think about. Um, Arvid. Uh, Arvid, oh, sorry. Hey, Arvid. Arvid Lindmark says, uh, when using wood in a beer, do you always do it in the same way or do you change anything? Length, method of adding, chips or staves based on style or target profile or do you do the same for every beer? Uh, yeah, great question. I like that one a lot. So I typically do the same thing um, and that is not at all because I should be doing that. That's just because I buy a bunch of uh, Hungarian typically or uh, sometimes American, but usually Hungarian oak cube uh, and I buy them in a very, very large package. So that's what I have around. It's what's available to me. And I, I really like the character that's contributed by cubes. Uh, I think that cubes give you a lot of control. Um, and so I pretty much just like lean into that as far as it goes. Uh, that said, 
I would 100% change and adjust uh, what I'm doing based on the t- the style or target profile and even a little bit, uh, like Eric mentioned, like a little bit of what we want to contribute in terms of body um, would leach just tannins into the beer. So like it's going to contribute some body of its own. Uh, and that's something that we can definitely leverage as brewers, like as we fine tune that. If it is a little thin, you might want to uh, use something that is more tannic. Um, so just like to answer that question in a better way, right now my standard process is I have a determined amount of oat cubes. I usually age for about two months. Um, those are usually just medium toast cubes. Uh, the amount of time you are aging depends greatly on how much you add. Uh, and I, I like to go with the less is more rule. So, uh, and that's just less wood for a longer period of time. I have found works out better for me than... Um, or I prefer that character as opposed to more wood or even um, a higher surface area product, something like the chips that you mentioned. Chips have a really, really high surface area to volume ratio compared to other wood aging products. So they are uh, they will leach uh, wood character into the beer really, really rapidly, uh, but they also have a less developed toast typically because when they are uh, chipped up and toasted, um, they don't develop a red layer like the cube does. Like the cube is going to develop a red layer. It's only going to penetrate so deep, and so you're going to get a little bit more uh, variance and your beer is going to have more contact time with that wood. So it's going to uh, extract more and it's going to uh, sink further. It's going to uh, seep and penetrate further into that wood. So uh, I, I almost always will go longer, but that's something that I will adjust my method of adding based on that um, for sure. Like if I'm going to use chips, um, I a hundred percent will always use a bag um, because just it is, it can get messy really quick. Um, if I'm using like a stave or I'm using a spiral, um, you, like the uh, piece of wood has like spirals cut down it. Um, I would use, I, I actually don't use anything. Like I wouldn't use a bag. So like loose material, like cubes, or uh, they also have something called spheres. I think it's, I think it's like XPH, um, but they're just like wood spheres instead of wood cubes. Those are really interesting. Um, Matt Crispin, who's a really, uh, who's a good friend and just a really great guy. He sent me some um, a couple years ago that he had aged a Merlot on and those were really, really exceptional. I liked that a lot. So it, it definitely depends. And I do def- uh, adjust based on like what the addition uh, based on on what kind of thing I'm adding, but more often than not, um, I find that cubes and use them, like boil them. Um, I do that to remove like the initial tannic character that's typically associated with like a freshly processed wood. Um, some people say you don't have to, some people like toast them in the oven. Uh, that's going to contribute an additional toast. You can always toast your own wood chips, wood cubes. That's a, that's definitely an option. Um, but it, they will do different methods of sanitizing. So it's, it's totally up to you. Um, I prefer boiling, adding them in a muslin bag that's also been uh, boiled and then just give it, give it time. Um, that's, that's my preferred method, but definitely flexible options that we can always talk more about. Uh, Jonathan McPherson, McPherson, God, Jonathan, I'm never going to like nail your last name. I know I've asked you before how to say it, but Jonathan McPherson, um, do you think in some cases it's better to just add wood staves versus aging beer in a small five to seven gallon barrel? Yeah, totally. Um, so here's the, we talked a little bit about surface area to volume ratio. Um, and that is, basically the the amount of beer you have relative to the surface area of the wood um and in a full-sized barrel that is not too much it's very small um and that means that your oxygen exchange rate uh within that beer is going to be slower because you have less of the beer in contact with the surface area um it is also like there's a lot of things that are contributed that go into that uh process But if you have a five to seven gallon barrel that has not been uh, waxed with like paraffin wax, uh, you can get like a food grade wax and wax the outside. Talk about that later. Uh, Then you have a very, very high surface area to volume ratio that is going to exchange oxygen really, really rapidly. Um, And so typically for a smaller barrel, you want less aging time. So in uh, that, that can definitely contribute um, because for a stave versus a five gallon barrel, uh, they have relatively similar aging times. I, I believe it's like a rule of thumb is like two months to four months um, in a small barrel like that, then that's about right because be, due to the fact that the surface area to volume ratio is so high, uh, you don't want to 
leave it in there for too long because you're going to start to develop some of those oxidative characters that may not uh, be beneficial. There might be some cases where you want that, like an old ale uh, benefits from having a little bit of that port-like um, oxidation that's like dark fruit, but something uh something else maybe you don't want it as much or you don't want it as rapidly too uh it's harder to control because it happens faster so i i actually don't love five to seven gallon barrels um also uh i think another case where it's better to have a stave is just surface or is just um uh space that you have like a five to seven gallon barrel takes up quite a bit of room um it's something that you need to maintain it's something that you need to make sure is cleaned it's something you need to make sure is uh something you're taking care of and that has like stand um racking in and out of it can be kind of a pain um if you're doing like a wood aged something that's like really sensitive to oxygen uh that would be another weight play so i would say that maybe it's better to use a stave because you can just do the stave in a keg and do close transfers on and off uh you can pull samples from a keg easier uh, unless you install like a vinny nail so like a stainless steel nail in a uh, barrel that'll you can draw samples from definitely an option um I think probably where it's, so I I would actually say in most cases, I prefer wood additions to like barrel aging. Uh, That said, for barrel aging, like large barrels um, are really great. And I think those have a unique character. You can account for the oxygen exchange rate in different ways with uh, wood additions. And I think that's something that homebrewers should take more advantage of. But the five to seven gallon barrel um also probably better for something like a sour beer i don't know nearly enough to talk about it technically which is unfortunate but uh the oxygen exchange rate within a barrel for a sour beer could potentially be beneficial depending on like what microbes you have um especially if you have like a mini home solera project where you are racking some of the uh, beer out uh, of a sour barrel and then racking uh, fresh wort in um, i think there's a lot of cool opportunities for that but i really like I like wood additions um, because I just think they're flexible. I think they're more flexible. Um, Eric Pierce asks, "Um, I've had a 50-gallon whiskey barrel that came from a distillery a few years ago. It's been in my fairly humid, prone-to-mold garage since then. Is there any hope for it? Um, I thought about using it for some club projects and keeping it at my local homebrew shop, but I fear it may not be in shape for that anymore. Any advice on how to proceed? Yeah, uh, my my advice is to talk to Brian Hall about that because he uh, has several full-size barrels and is experienced cleaning them. But I'm going to give you my quick two cents, which is uh, I would be really... If it's been sitting empty, which I think is... Uh, I think is what you're implying. Um, I'd be really hesitant to use it. So you can definitely fill it up with water, see if it's leaking, um, see if it, see if it's even usable at this point, like um, uh, mold and stuff aside. Um, see if it's still age or see if it still holds liquid to the point that you can use it. Um, and if it does have cracks or anything like that that have developed because it's been dry for so long, uh, then obviously that's your answer. But if you have an opportunity that it does hold liquid, uh, my next step would be to, I've, I've seen some people use wallpaper steamers, um, in order to sanitize barrels. So I would figure I would do some research on like cleaning that barrel out, sanitizing. The problem is wood is so porous. Like you're, if you have mold or like bacteria, it can really sink into, it can get just such a strong hold in the wood. Um, there's, at a certain point, like no recovering from that kind of an infection. Um, so if you're if you're serious about it, like and you really want to try to get this thing back in action, uh, talk to Brian, see if he has any advice. But I would advise against it. I would I would think it's probably not in not in too good a shape anymore. Um, another question from Arvid, uh, who says, "What style of beer works best with wood aging, in your opinion?" Um, that's a great question. I mean, I think one obviously that you intend to age. Um, if I've, I've had a couple wood aged, uh, I've had a couple of wood aged IPAs and they're okay. Um, I don't usually love like the combination of character, like the hop character and the wood. Um, but the, uh, how do I say it? I, I have also had like Pilsners though, that like you typically wouldn't age that beyond, uh, per- potentially like a lagering process. Uh, so, and I've had some wood aged Pilsners that I think are really good. Uh, actually the brewery distill, uh, down in, uh, Bloomington, normal Illinois, they had, or maybe have, but they had a wood aged Imperial Pilsner called Bella. Um, and that was really, really good. So I, I think that there's a lot of potential, like a lot of styles can benefit from it, but 
I think in my experience, the malty styles tend to fare a little bit better than hoppy styles or ones that are uh, a really light malty character. Uh, so like crackers and toast, um, though toast can definitely play into wood aging really, really well. Um, I, I think like obviously just darker beers come to mind first only because that's traditionally what we see, but I just think malty styles. So in terms of styles, I guess that's a weird question because maybe it's not styles so much as that go well with it, but it's like what actual, uh, what characteristics of those styles are, uh, go well with beer. Like when we line them up, uh, what are the overlapping trends? And I think in that regard, I think things that pair really well with wood and that character tend to be um, just like a either caramel or uh, like biscuit toast, uh, I think are both really good malt characters that go well with wood. Um, I think that dark fruit obviously goes really well aged. Um, And also like when we talk about wood aging, we tend to talk about... uh, aging on like a liquor or some kind of uh, alcohol aside from the beer itself and that's going to play a really strong role on what your style is like you may have a really really good we'll use the pilsner as an example like you can probably have a good wood aged pilsner but if it's like a whiskey wood aged pilsner is that is that still going to be good? So I think that there's that association as well. Um, I will say there's an exceptional book, really, really good. And I'm going to, uh, I am upset that I don't remember who wrote it called the flavor Bible. And that is a fantastic resource to start looking at what flavors and characteristics tend to go with one another. Um, it's, it's an exceptional book where you can look up things like raisin and then see some other, st- uh, see some other things that tend to be complementary to that flavor. And if you wanted to explore, or other styles and wood aging or other liquors or other even kinds of wood. Um, that's a really big one where if you want to try a cherry, um, a cherry wood versus, you know, the standard um, oak, which is what we typically use, um, those will contribute different characteristics and you can play off of that, uh, when you're designing your beer and when you're picking your style. So highly recommend the flavor Bible, really, really good resource for that. Absolutely. Uh, I think that's a good place to start. BrewersFriend.com offers everything needed by brewers of all levels, from the novice to the seasoned professional, including their feature-packed recipe builder that allows brewers to track their progress and record all data to improve brewing consistency. Brewers Friend also offers a slew of new features to cater to the professional brewing industry, such as groups which allow multiple users to access one brewery account, tank tracking which tracks the current status of any vessel, as well as inventory projections and custom alerts. Head over to BrewersFriend.com now and use code PODCAST at checkout to save 10% on your membership. Again, that's code PODCAST at brewersfriend.com When dumping wort-soaked grain in leftover low-gravity wort while cleaning up after a brew day, do you ever wonder what your true efficiency would be if that wort made its way to the kettle instead? Using the brew bag, a fabric filter for all mash tuns and brewing methods, allows you to capture every last drop of wort. Not only does this increase kettle efficiency, it lowers your grain bill, which saves you money. Throwing wort in the trash is like dumping a 12-pack down the drain and just doesn't make sense. Use the brew bag and leave no work behind. I've been using these filters for a long time and recommend them to everyone. I never have to worry about a stuck sparge and cleanup is fast and easy. Go grab yourself a brew bag fabric filter at brewinabag.com and be sure to use code TBP17 at checkout to get a discount on your order. Family-owned Atlantic Brew Supply is the largest homebrew shop in the Southeast. No gimmicks, no multinational corporate overlords, and no BS. They offer exclusive malts, yeast, and more from local artisans, as well as award-winning recipe kits. They also sell professional brewing gear and cask equipment from sister companies ABS Commercial and Cask Supply. Most ingredients are available by the ounce, plus Atlantic Brew Supply has an on-site calculator to help you craft your best brew. Orders are processed same day, and two-day shipping is guaranteed for East Coast customers. Get 15% off your first order using promo code. BrewPod. That's B R U P O D at AtlanticBrewSupply.com. After a long brew day, the last thing I want to do is waste more time chilling wort. I've tried so many different options, and ultimately, I settled on the super efficient immersion chillers made by Jaded Brewing. With the King Cobra and Hydra, I'm able to chill my entire batch of wort from boiling to just a few degrees above groundwater temperature in as little as six minutes. If an immersion chiller is right for your brewery, then do yourself a favor and check out all of the rad options Jaded Brewing has to offer at jadedbrewing.com and be sure to let them know Brewlosophy sent you. Hey 
Eric Pierce, who is on fire, uh, has Brulosophy ever considered doing a Malt Chronicles? Not to my knowledge. Um, we So we've never done a Malt Chronicles, and I don't know if we've ever like thrown that idea around in like a serious way. It's never really been piloted in a way that I would say is uh, like serious. Um, there's definitely like the malt comparisons that we've done as experiments and those try to lean more into, you know, uh, so for example, like for a Scottish ale, we hear that golden promise is a hundred percent the thing that we have to utilize because for reasons, um, despite the fact that a lot of Scottish breweries use Maris Otter, um, and then we can compare that to things that we know are also being used or just potentially different. And so there's, that's a little bit of, it's not really malt chronicles at all, but it's like just trying to explore what base malts or other malts contribute to beers um, and contextually, like how we do that. But as far as malt chronicles go, I really like the idea. I think it's really interesting. Um, I don't know... I don't know how we would do it really, really well. It's something we'd have to explore and like think more about. Um, I, I, but it's not been on anyone's radar. It's never been something that we have explored. Um, that said, like based on the experiments and we talk about this internally a lot is, um, you actually, you hear that question in the podcast a lot or in different Q and a episodes, like what's the, what's the experiment that the most changed your views or whatever it is. I think one of the things that has become increasingly obvious, at least to me, as I've gone through brewing and just work, uh, working with brewlosophy and doing that is, uh, just that recipe matters, obviously. And that, that is one of those things that seems obvious. Um, but malts are very, very central to what we do. And like the quality of malt is central to what we do and how malt is uh, stored, uh, potentially has an impact. So I think, I think malt definitely is a cool thing to explore as a malt chronicle, but I, I just don't know how we would do it. I don't know how we would do it really well. If you have ideas, I'm totally open to it. I think it's a cool thing. And I know we definitely always want to what content would people like, right? Um, And what things would be interesting for us. And I'm interested in malt a lot, um, more so than hops. So Uh, Jordan asks, what's your favorite yeast for big beers? Uh, That depends really, that uh, I'm going to give you uh, probably two, probably two, I'll narrow it down. Um, The first is if I am going for something that's a little sweeter um, than the uh, five, no, sorry, <laughs> sorry. I was reading a text message. Um, then the, uh, the McEwen's strain, which is Y yeast, uh, 1728. Uh, it is Imperial yeast, uh, tartan. Um, that is a Scottish ale strain that ferments very, very well, um, at slightly cooler temperatures, not, not lager cool, but slightly cooler. Um, Lager temperatures, if you're Marshall, if you're Marshall, they're lager temperatures. But if you are uh, the rest of us, then it's slightly higher than that. Uh, the It leaves behind a little bit of residual sweetness, I've found, uh, but it's a really, really great yeast and really versatile. It's very clean, um, and I think it is... A really, really great. So if you're doing something like a wee heavy, um, or you're doing something like even an imperial stout that you want a little more residual sweetness to, and you want to like stay away from crystal malts, which I totally get. Um, then I would, I would highly recommend 1728. If you look at a lot of actual, uh, actually, if you look at some, uh, past American homebrew competition, uh, RIS winners, Imperial Stout winners, um, quite a few of them use 1728. So it's definitely a viable option for uh, a variety of styles. The other one is probably San Diego super. Um, and that is uh, white labs. I think it's 090. Um, but it is very, very clean and attenuates very well. Um, I just really like attenuative yeasts. I don't, like really under attenuative yeasts typically um i i want a beer to have as low a final gravity as it can have um and that's just me uh we actually had like a a, like a a mini argument about this in the brewing chat the other day between between the brulosophy guys and like you hear the dogma of like drying out a beer which uh, i will 100 percent admit is a misnomer i don't think that's entirely an accurate way to talk about it it's maybe just convenient but not accurate um but that one the, the the whole idea of leaving an intentional high final gravity is just not for me. I really like uh, getting a beer's final gravity is down as much as it can and then rely on the rest of the process like mash temperature uh, and um, uh, th- things like uh, just different malts to relay character like that. Um, so that's that's really 
where I'm at for that one for big beer. So definitely. So super San Diego super. Um, if you can't get that, then, uh, I mean, 1968, uh, which is, um, I think, I believe that's the fuller strain. That's a really exceptional one. If you're doing like a big English barley wine, that's a really great yeast too. And I've had really, really great experiences with it. It's also very good in an Imperial stout. If you're leaning into the English, uh, Imperial stout, territory, um, which deserves to be explored more. We see a lot of American yeast with that style. Um, commercially for Imperial Stout, you actually see a lot of Chico use. Um, Chico is really, is re- at least reported as a really, really frequent use um, in a lot of different commercial Imperial Stouts that I, I 1050 included, uh, that I really enjoy. So I think that's viable as well. I, I've been staying away from Chico recently i've used flagship a couple times actually now that i'm like trying to think about it a little bit more um so i think that's viable option as well i think you have a lot of options but definitely pick one that's attenuative uh and if you want a little sweeter then go with 17 or go with uh the McEwen strain which is tartan or 1728 uh and if you are going with something that maybe you want a little more yeast character uh fuller strain 1968 great option uh, and if you want something clean san diego super or chico one of one of those is gonna stand out to you as something that's exceptional cider time of year is my absolute favorite time of year i really like having cider around it's been a while actually we uh my wife and i just moved and so we have not been uh well, we moved, man, it's almost been a year actually, but I just, I just now feel like we are settling into things a little bit more, um, which is really, really nice. So I'm enjoying that. Um, and as that's happening, it means I have more time to like go into brewing and different things. Um, and just like try different projects. Uh, I know I made Skeeter P like somewhat recently for the website and that was a couple months, that was a months long project. Uh, it's actually takes a while to brew. But that was a lot of fun to brew. So just having the opportunity to uh, try some different things and experiment has been really, really great. Uh, I'm also getting to go back out to homebrew clubs. There was like a period of time where I was doing so much house stuff and just trying to settle in and unpack and support my wife, obviously, um, that we weren't doing that as much. So I'm, I'm really loving going back out to homebrew clubs and just talking to people. It's been really fun. Um, we have a question from Arvid who asks, uh, what do you think is the best way to go about brewing a malty low ABV beer? Uh, does the alcohol on its own add anything to the final result? Uh, yeah, I mean, it totally does. Alcohol has a flavor. Absolutely. Um, so that's, that's something that you are, it's, it's going to be difficult to replicate. And I don't, I don't know that I would aim for it. Um, I think there's a couple really good theories for how to brew a great multi low ABV beer. And I will quickly go through, um, I think, I think one, so first off mash temperature, um, as we, as we have a higher mash temperature in theory, you are creating, uh, you're in like the alpha amylase territory. So you are creating longer chains that are not as easy for the yeast to consume or metabolize. And then you're ultimately going to have a beer that has a fire, a higher final gravity and therefore less alcohol. So high mash temperatures um, can be utilized for sure to brew a beer that's definitely lower alcohol and still good malt character to it. Um, I also have not found that, and this is actually goes back to like the dry is a misnomer thing I mentioned earlier. I haven't found that a higher final gravity necessarily means that the beer is overly sweet. Um, I think there's a threshold probably. I I'd have had a, I, I screwed up a uh, Quake uh, beer recently and it was, it ended up like my, my temperature probe was on the wrong kettle. And so I had to rebrew that one, but it was on the wrong kettle. And so I ended up mashing at like 164 or like 168, like crazy high temperatures. And I fermented that beer anyways, because fuck it. Like that's what we're going to do. Um, and hopefully Marshall will change that for the podcast, but we ended up uh, brewing that one and I fermented it and it was very sweet. Uh, and I, I mean, obviously I use fake yeast. Uh, I did it really, really hot. So there's a lot of things that I have minimal experience with that could have contributed to that character, but it was definitely sweet. So I think there is maybe like some, uh, relationship and there is definitely, I mean, theoretically, of course, there's a relationship as you have longer, you have more sugars because of final gravity than it would make sense that it'd be sweeter, but I think within um, a range, I haven't found that to be the case or at least not like in an extreme way. 
So mash temperature is one lever we have. Um, and also on the carbonation note, that carbonation gets the short end of the stick. Carbonation uh, influences your perception of sweetness um, in a pretty, in an inverse relationship. So as carbonation goes up, uh, your perception of sweetness actually goes down uh, in drinks and liquids. So if you do mash high and you're like, oh, this is a little sweet, uh, lean lean more carbonation than less carbonation and that should potentially help uh that that could potentially influence it that's not something we've done an experiment on um and it's hard to gauge that kind of thing uh personally like just if i brewed it separate times but it's uh there's a lot of research on it it's really really interesting as a subject um Another option that we have, and this is something, this is another thing I haven't had experience with, but I am trying to figure out how to do either an experiment or a brew it yourself, uh, some some kind of content for it. The uh, non enzymatic mashing is a really interesting avenue, I think, for exploring this content. So non enzymatic mashing um, is from Dan uh, Dan Beese, and he works at Brees. He's a, I believe he's a technical uh, director. Um, might be a little lower on the totem pole than that, but he's a very, very smart guy. He has an exceptional article that he wrote on, uh, on non-enzymatic mashing uh, or cold mashing from the site. And basically non-enzymatic mashing is this idea that you can mash at a very low uh, temperature, like refrigerator temperatures for a very long period of time. And end up extracting about the same amount of proteins and like the same amount of color and aroma compounds, but far less fermentable sugar. And so there's like two approaches people are taking to that. The first is if I do a non-enzymatic mash for a standard batch of beer, like a standard grain amount, um, because you're not extracting as much sugar, you are going to end up like if you use enough grains for a 1050 batch, you might end up actually having like a 1017 OG because you're not extracting nearly as many uh, gravity points. But in theory, you're extracting just as many color and aroma compounds in some of the uh, the flavor compounds as well. So some people are trying that uh, in regards to brewing low gravity batches. Um, trying to do a non enzymatic mash on a standard batch and then you end up fermenting that out. Another good option and this is uh that's people are doing with the non enzymatic mash is taking that math and just scaling it up and so using a bunch of grain to hit like 1050 or 10 1040 or 1030 whatever your uh, standard gravity would be for that style uh, and non enzymatic mashing and then having a lot more of the color compounds the aroma compounds and flavor compounds uh, but matching the alcohol percentage so you ha- aim for like a three percent beer but you end up pulling a lot more of this out so that's a really cool avenue to explore is the non enzymatic mashing but I think mash temperature for sure uh, is a good one uh, and I, and for me, that is it. So my, one of my favorite styles is, uh, a style called Scottish heavy, not to be confused with we heavy, uh, which it, this used to be called, uh, I believe 70 shilling. Um, I think historically that's probably more accurate. We'd have to ask Ron Pattinson, but the, the 70 shilling or the Scottish heavy is a multi low, naturally low gravity, like three or 4% uh, beer that is full, just really full in flavor that I really, really love. And my experience has been uh, positive with higher mash temperatures um, and leaning away from uh, leaning away from specialty malts in terms of percentage. Uh, so the percentage is a weird way to talk about specialty malts for sure, because uh, it's they, you know, in, in situations like Beersmith, they scale with gravity. Um, but regardless, you still have a, then you'd have a higher amount in the same volume of batch. So right, like when you think about specialty grains, we tend to think about them contextual to gravity, um, which I think is, is potentially not wrong necessarily. Cause that's, that's not, it's not necessarily wrong, of course, because you might prefer it or like it and that's totally fine and acceptable. Um, uh, but I think thinking about the role specialty grains have in within a given batch, as opposed to in the context of how much base malt you have that. It is, it's just not, it doesn't make a ton of sense to me. So lean, lean away from specialty. Uh, just play with your grain, uh, in a lot in that, um, and just explore naturally low gravity styles. Like there's like dark, mild Scottish heavy, uh, Berliner Weiss. There's, there's uh, British gold nail. There's really exceptional styles that are naturally low gravity. If you approach even as like a classic style. So, uh, I think that'd be my advice is explore styles that are naturally that way. Um, 
<laughs> I'm going to, Jonathan, I'm not skipping your question, but Eric is very uh, happy about non-enzymatic mashing, uh, which, which hopefully I don't, I don't have experience with it, but I, I really want to be excited about it. I really want it to be, um, something that's interesting. I don't want to blow 70 pounds of grain, uh, on, on a 1050 batch. I'm not quite that brave. Um, but I think it's really cool. Um, Oh, another thing, Arvid, actually, I'm so sorry. Uh, Brian uh, Hall, another contributor for Blosphy, was just recently talking about his experience with a reiterated mash. Um, it is really cool. And as an idea, he's uh, he reported having some really good um, just malt character from it. Uh, I would be interested to see how that works with a lower gravity beer. I think that there's potential there. So for those who don't know, reiterated mashing is the uh, you're using. So doing your first mash and then using the wort to mash a second round of grains. Um, really handy for people who are have smaller mash tons who can't handle like a large uh, grain bill and a large ABV for something like a really high alcohol beer. Um, but, uh, also supposedly, obviously, because you're mashing another round of grains, you're also getting more of the flavor and, uh, aroma and just sugar, of course. So I'd be interested to see reiterated mash a little more and see that with uh, lower ABV beers. I think that's another opportunity you have. Uh, so Jonathan, uh, asks, I'm actually working on a Solera project, which is why I inquired about staves versus barrels. I've got two six gallon Lambic style sours with different yeast bends. Oh, I'm sorry. So you've got two, uh, six gallon Lambic sours. That's what you've got. Great. Um, so I've got two different yeast blends. I've been aging them in glass fermenter for the past seven months. Uh, one, I want to add raspberries to, and the other cherries. I'm a few weeks from looking to transfer them into barrels. I plan to get, I'll then brew two more batches to blend and top off the barrels once I bottle some. My concern is calculating the oxygen exposure and obviously uh, ruining the beer, which is a fair concern. I'd be a bit sad to invest that much time uh, and I will add money to this. That's not in Jonathan's comment, but let's just throw money in there uh, and mess it up. Yeah, I think that's totally fair. I think that's entirely valid. And of course, you don't want to invest that much time, money, and just, um, you know, like obviously there's a little bit of emotional dedication to this whole thing uh, that you don't want to have that turn out poorly. So that that's totally fair. Um, so for what you're going for, the Lambic style sours, uh, I... <sighs> I'm, I'm so hesitant to talk about sour beers because I don't have tons of experience with them. Um, but like I said, uh, a lot of sour beers reportedly benefit from the micro oxygen exchange that happens in barrels. So that is uh, something you could do. Now that said, there are a lot of, um, there are a lot glass. You're not going to have anything. If you used glass, uh, as your secondary fermenter for these in your mini Solera project, then you don't need to worry about that. Obviously. Um, but the, uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Uh, but so you don't need to worry about that as much because you can, there's a lot of papers that will show you like if you have this kind of, uh, airlock bung or versus another material, you can sort of, uh, use that to gauge how much oxygen is going to be exchanged, uh, with the headspace that is in the fermenter. So that's one way to look at that. But with barrels, um, especially small barrels, which I imagine is what you're getting, I would look, I would look pretty seriously into what you want your oxygen exchange rate to be for those, uh, and then compensate with, uh, with food grade wax, like paraffin wax. And, uh, especially like the heads of those barrels, um, are just an opportunity for you to, uh, limit the oxygen exposure that those are seeing. Um, so that's, that's where I would go. I would look up like what you want your oxygen exposure to be. I will, uh, now and forever, um, advocate for milk, the funk, uh, which is an exceptional Facebook page and just resource in general, highly recommended. They'll definitely be able to answer some of those questions as well. And I know they actually have a section on, uh, on paraffin waxing and like, uh, preparing barrels for that kind of use. If that's the way you want to go, because there's a really cool romantic aspect to barrels, right? Like barrel aging. Uh, it sounds better than wood aging. Uh, and it is just really nice. Like it's a, it's a historical thing. It's something we did for a long time. So the degree of romanticism I think is totally fair, but overall, I, I think you'd be fine going either approach. Absolutely. Um, I will say it's probably going to be in for terms of a Solera, um, it'll probably be more fun for you to use barrels and it'd probably be better for you. And especially because you can prep those barrels and then you're going to be just keep reusing them. Um, and because it's sour, like don't worry too much about, Oh, it's stripping, um, the wood character, which it will over time. So there, you have some options. I advocate milk the funk as always. 
uh, and look into some of those resources, but I would plan on having to prep them with some, with some food grade wax. Um, <clears throat> uh, Arvid has another question, which is for big beers, especially when wood aging, what's your take on water chemistry? Is there anything, uh, is there anything general to be said about big beers? Does it vary much across styles? Uh, of, I mean, of course, yeah, it varies across styles. Absolutely. That's, that's the, um, the easy one. Uh, but that said, I, I do think, uh, in regards to wood aging, something to keep in mind is that, uh, wood of course leaches tannins. Um, you, and obviously, and also, uh, oxidation tends to contribute to the perception of mouthfeel. I think, I think negatively. Um, so I would, I would pay attention more there when you're thinking about your water chemistry, uh, making sure that you are, uh, Comp- compensating for like how that beer is going to be perceived after the wood aging takes place and like what kind of wood aging you're doing. Um, so that for me would be obviously like a little bit more, um, like a little bit more salt can help bring out like perceptions of meatiness, I guess. I did an experiment on that recently and meatiness was one of the things that people typically associated with salt, uh, which was really, really interesting at the time, but a little more sodium could potentially influence, um, like how round that beer is. Um, and obviously we of course associate like calcium chloride, like so chloride, um, we, you want to lean into as well. So it's all, it's all about like just how you want that perception to be handled afterwards. What kind of style, like you can, uh, have a really big Pilsner, uh, or an Imperial Pilsner or something like a double IPA, uh, that you want to be, that you're going to lean differently into like that sulfide chloride, that sulfate chloride ratio, uh, as opposed to something like an Imperial stout or a barley wine. But in regards to wood aging, pay attention to the, the body that's going to be contributed and pay attention to the development of, uh, the, the breakdown of some of those compounds during the oxidation process. And as, as staling happens, um, and if, if you want Arvid, you can always reach out and I will, uh, I'll reach, I'll look, look into that more. I'm happy to learn more about that. Cause it's something that I think is worth paying more attention to. Um, Steve Thanos joins and says, Hey man, Hey Steve. Uh, great to, great to hear from you, man. I'm glad you were able to join us. Um, I'm able to drink far less than I thought I would be during this. I definitely expected to be able to have a couple more periods of pausing and being able to drink. Um, but that's okay because it is pretty early here, uh, about twelve fifty my time. So we got like ten minutes, um, and I'm more than happy to follow up with anyone or answer answer any other questions or look into something more. Uh, that's definitely I think a really been a really cool thing about working with Brewlosophy is you know, that old like cheesy maxim of like, if you want to learn something, try to teach it. Um, I I think in a lot of ways that holds true because it's like, I have to think through how to research something. That's that's what I do um, professionally is qualitative research. So part of my job is to do secondary, not just primary research, but secondary research, uh, consume that information and then communicate it in such a way that it is appropriate for whatever target audience. And that's uh, like a similar to uh, technical writing in, uh, in that regard. And so that's been a fun part of real philosophy is like flexing those muscles and like learn, like being like, well, okay, well, if someone has this question or we want to talk about this thing, uh, what is the best way to consume the re- available resources, follow up on threads and then, uh, communicate it in such a way that it is easy to digest. So it's been a really cool format to work that in. So if anyone has anything that we talked about today that they're either unsure on, um, or something that maybe seems wrong, um, I'm always, I love being wrong. Um, I think that's fine. Like I have no problem with being wrong and there's no ego involved in that. So as long as we can, uh, as long as we get the right answer, like that's more important. So if anyone does have something they want to follow up on, please feel free to reach out. It's uh, mad at brewlosophy.com. Um, and I am more than happy to follow up on pretty much anything. Uh, I love being able to answer emails and just talk to people about that. Uh, and someone's angry. I don't really know why, but I just got that. Uh, I just got that show up. Um, if you are angry, you are more than welcome to uh, comment or, um, I guess, like email me or something. That's okay. We can we can work that out. It's okay, man. Uh, as a part of what I've been doing recently for philosophy, I've had a lot of fun uh, exploring the different fake strains. Um, and I would love, like, if people have experience with uh, Quake that they'd like to share uh, ever, like, and just email me about, that'd be really cool. Because I think there's a lot of opportunity in that yeast. Like, it's blown up. It's been all over the place. 
but I'm, I'm personally really invested in like how these blends are represented by uh, professional companies. Like people, people like Omega or people like Imperial um, have either isolates or uh, obviously some companies are developing these blends of which, you know, Quebec strains typically are is these, these blends. And just how hardy these yeasts are is really, really interesting to me and how the blends versus the isolates potentially plays a role in their, both their percept, <clears throat> sorry about that, both their perception and what we're able to do with them. I think that's a really interesting area to explore. And it's something I want to learn more about. Uh, and I definitely don't have experience with like Hornendal or like some of the other uh, big strains. I think that'll be fun to explore more too. But that's been a really fun project lately is just diving more into the Quebec strains, um, diving more into how how the landscape is potentially changing in that regard i know a lot of breweries who are using uh quake for like their new england ipa because it's very fruity and uh tends not to drop out super well uh there's i've certainly seen some clear uh quake beers but uh they they are usually a little hazier in my experience but that might also just be fast turnaround like a lot of a lot of quake is so uh quickly done um, that, you know, it doesn't have tons and tons of opportunity to do so. Um, so that's something that is just up in the air. It's been a lot, it's been a cool project and, uh, one of the fun ones for me, for sure. Um, another thing that I've been working on that I'm really, really excited about is just exploring, uh, just exploring like the different fermenters and different, like, so I've been doing like some personal experience on experiments on my own. Um, and just like trying to figure out some more stuff about Imperial stout, which is an area that I'm, uh, really that I'm really passionate about. And I really like Imperial stouts and it's going to be that time of year. It's starting to get colder here in Illinois. Um, which I'm sure Steve Thanos can uh, attest to. We both are here. Um, but Illinois took a downturn into uh, temperatures really, really quick. And so as I'm like looking into Imperial Stout stuff, uh, I'm finding a lot of research around just like the the different impacts of osmotic pressure and hydrostatic pressure um, and exploring different fermentation vessels, I think has been a really fun way. One thing that uh, specifically in regards to fermentation vessels that I think is really interesting is that I think we've talked about this on the podcast way back um, a little before, but I'm, I'm sort of like diving back into this research on the ways in which uh, Imperial Stout is potentially more um, susceptible to oxygen than we think it is, right? Like there's this perception that New England IPA is super hypersensitive to oxygen, and the reason that is is that hops contribute uh metals in some way like manganese um and they and i think oats do as well uh, so that's also contributing to that problem we see a lot of oat use in new england ipa and so that they're hypersensitive to oxidation and especially cold side oxidation uh one thing i've been reading more and more uh, is just the role that uh so there's like conflicting research of like whether or not uh, roasted malts and crystal malts are more or less susceptible to oxidation. Uh, and I'm, I'm tending to think they potentially are more, especially as a result of like just the distribution of free radicals is increased uh, as the uh, SRM goes up uh, as, as like the malt, the MCU, the malt color unit, as that goes up, distribution of free radicals is higher and more of those oxygen uh, oxygen sensitive compounds end up in beer so that's something that I think I would really like to explore further because there is like this idea that because it is a big beer and because it is an imperial stout because it's like malty as opposed to hoppy uh, that it isn't as susceptible to oxygen and it's, it's something that is uh maybe even benefits from oxygen and from the the oxidation that's associated with something like barrel aging uh but you know i mean imperial stouts have typically like 70 to 80 ibus uh they have a lot of malts that are potentially more sensitive to oxygen than something like a pilsner malt uh, based on just some of the research i was reading recently uh, so I think that's another area that I want to explore more. Uh, and in the just to bring it back to the fermentation vessel work that I've been thinking about, uh, figuring out how to do different degrees of uh, closed transfers has been on my mind a lot. So for, with the anvil fermenters uh, and just glass fermenters in general, I think there's room to continue exploring those and uh, figure out how to do more closed transfers because I, I don't think that we're free of the problem when, when we don't, it's, if it's not a hoppy beer, we're like, Oh, it's not a, it's not a new England IPA. So it's fine. I don't, I don't know if it's fine. I think, I think there's things that are in these styles uh, and maybe even in the water that uh, will give us more problems uh, based on that. So I, I'm even in those styles, I'm starting to explore more what, what it looks like to reduce uh, that cold side oxidation and what 
potentially is impacting their susceptibility to uh, uh, oxygen uh, perception, uh, perception of oxidative characters after time. Um, so that's what I'm doing right now, and I'm really enjoying it. It's been a blast. Uh, there's obviously other stuff in the works for philosophy that I've, I'm really excited about. Uh, ongoing podcast work has been a blast. It's always tons of fun to do stuff like the live Q and A like this. I thank you all for just coming and for uh, asking questions. It was a lot of fun to talk about this, and there's definitely some things that I want to. Uh, I'm going to take some notes and follow up with a couple of you on uh, some things that I want to explore more, and not not just make sure I'm right, but make sure that I'm giving you the whole picture. Uh, and if I'm wrong to correct myself, I want you to have the right information. I'm not interested in being right personally. Um, but so that's something I want to do as a next step, but otherwise, um, just settling in and working with the house a little bit more and getting, getting more brewing projects get done has been a blast. So I'm looking forward to sharing more with you guys in the near future about what I've been working on. Um, and just writing more about, uh, these, these different experiments that we got going. Um, so I hope this was fun for everyone. Uh, it was definitely fun for me. I actually had a lot more fun than I thought I would because I'm not, uh, I don't love talking for an hour. Um, and I, it's, it's a little weird for me, but, uh, it helps that I just get to read your comments instead of ask something specifically. Oh, I'm sorry. We have two, we have one more. Um, Arvid and Eric, you are welcome just for you. Uh, you and I can have a Q and a anytime. I know we actually did a little bit earlier in the week about bubbles, uh, the, uh, the cider yeast. So, um, I was right, uh, that I feel very validated in that. Um, but Arvid, uh, it says you have some experiments on mash temperature showing that participants are unable to distinguish beers with the same amount of malt, even though they are more than a percentage unit of alcohol different. Going back to what you said about alcohol being having a flavor in a big beer, this difference in alcohol would be larger in two beers with the same malt bill, but different mashes. Do you think that the test panel would show up more clearly? Oh, do you think that this would show up more clearly in a test panel or is the malt bill the biggest difference between these beers? Okay. So just to rephrase quickly, Arvid, uh, what what you are asking is, do I believe that a larger effect size would be uh, detectable by the sample that we are using in the experiment? Um, potentially. Yeah, potentially there's, there's a relation uh, and this is the qual researcher come in me coming out, but like the, the relationship between sample size and effect size is um, well established. And so, uh, and I, I don't want to speculate and say, if we did have a larger effect size, would a smaller sample be able to detect it? The answer is maybe, absolutely maybe. Um, because there is a character to alcohol uh, and, but what that threshold is and what that threshold is uh, in the context of a given beer, that's a little more difficult, right? Like it's, it's not just, oh, this thing has a flavor. It's what is the flavor of this thing relative to the experience you are having at any given time? Like we know that sound influences our perception of alcohol. Um, and so, I mean, that's wild, isn't it? Like lower, lower frequency sounds tend to make things seem more alcoholic. Uh, so as, we are, uh, as you explore like a context of a beer, the answer is maybe it, it for sure could, uh, influence it. If the effect size is larger then in theory, a smaller sample would be needed to, uh, uh, to detect that. So an example of that would be like, if you have, um, apple juice and orange juice and you have people do a triangle test in theory, because they are, this is off the top of my head, but I would assume radically perceptibly different. Um, then you would in theory need a smaller sample size to pick up that difference. Um, but that's, and, and that's the thing about the experiments too, is like the argument is never that there's no difference. That's a ridiculous thing because we do a variable, which means that there is for sure a hundred percent, a chemical difference between those things. Um, but whether or not the effect size introduced by that is detectable by the sample of people. Um, that's, that's the question. So the answer to your questions, maybe, um, I think, I mean, I don't know. I don't want to speculate on whether or not it would be, uh, whether it would be detectable, but I think it, it could potentially change it. Absolutely. Yeah, most definitely. Um, so that is about uh, my time, guys. I know I rambled quite a bit there at the end, but I really do appreciate everyone coming and just asking questions. You're always free to reach out to me. Again, that's Matt at brewlosophy.com. Um, I'm always open to exploring more of these questions uh, and then following up with anyone on anything I've happened to say. So uh, please feel free to reach out and I hope you all have an amazing rest of your day. Thank you for being patrons. Thank you for supporting us. We couldn't do this without you um, and it is an absolute blast to be able to do this and engage with all of you. So I just really appreciate the fact that uh, you guys think the work we're doing is not only valuable but uh, enjoyable because it is 100% enjoyable for us. We love doing it. So, yeah.
And there you have it, Brewlosophy's Matt Del Fiaco. Huge thanks to him for sitting down uh, for a little over an hour uh, with patrons of Brewlosophy one Saturday morning. And a huge thanks to all of the other awesome folks who have uh, taken the time to answer patron questions. Again, like Matt said, we could not do this if it weren't for the people who support us over at patreon.com slash brewlosophy. If you like this kind of stuff, if you like being rewarded for supporting something that you enjoy, head over there now. Again, that's patreon.com slash brewlosophy. Check out the rewards that you can get for helping us to continue bringing you this show. Uh, And don't forget to head over to brulosophy.com to read up on all of the crazy stuff we're up to. The Brulosophy Podcast is made possible by the generous support of our sponsors as well as all of our rad listeners. We seriously could not do this without you. Cheers to everyone who has subscribed and left a review of our show. It makes a huge difference. If you haven't yet, please consider doing so. Head over to brulosophy.com slash support to view a list of ways you can easily help us to continue producing this podcast. If you want a reward for your support, visit patreon.com slash brulosophy. Thanks again for listening. We'll be back next week with another episode of the Brulosophy Podcast. Until then, think beer. Start off the morning with some hot tea, lemon and honey, cause it soothes my bro. Put some herb in the bowl, yeah, it's homegrown. Ain't gotta go through the middle.